Welcome to the Events Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor, and each week I talk with event professionals and entrepreneurs about how they plan, promote, and run their events. We help you build your events empire by growing your business using live events. Whether you're running community meetups or conferences, trade shows, and other events, we focus on finding actionable tips that you can use straight away. We want you to get more attendees, produce epic events, make more money, and most importantly, to do it all with no stress. This podcast is sponsored by EventsFrame. Check it out over at eventsframe.com. Make the switch from Eventbrite today to our amazing ticketing and registration system with no ticket fees. Most ticketing systems charge you a minimum of 3% of the ticket price, but we just have a flat low fee with no ticket fees and no restrictions. There's literally no system out there that is cheaper than EventsFrame. It's also super easy to use and you can embed your tickets in your website or you can use our own website builder, which is really simple. We have amazing options to apply all kinds of discounts on all the features you'd expect from a much more expensive system like QR code check-in. Go to eventsframe.com, that's E-V-E-N-T-S, F-R-A-M-E dot com for a free, no risk, one month trial. Hello and welcome to the events podcast. I'm Dan Taylor. Today, I'm delighted to be talking to Mikey Robbins on the line from Philadelphia. Mikey's his website is themikeyrobbins.com, T-H-E-M-I-K-E-A-R-O-B-I-N-S.com. He's a former chef, uh, I think a current chef as well. He's a um, TV personality and a, an event planner, which is most relevant to us, runs a lot of events and celebrations. So, Mikey, welcome to the podcast. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So we were just talking before, like, where, where just give us a, some background. Where, where are you calling from? Are you at home in a moment? And where, where are you, et cetera? Yeah, so right in Philadelphia, outside of Rittenhouse Square, born and raised right outside of Philadelphia, but I am at the moment in Philadelphia as well. Great. And I guess Philadelphia, as people who don't know, I've, I've been a few times, it's, it's, it's pretty good because it's, it's pretty close to New York. I mean, you, you can get there's a, yes. direct, a pretty good train connection, actually, which is unusual in America. Yes, it really is. And I always tell people I can get to New York in about an hour through the train, which is amazing. And it, it's one of those locations that Philadelphia has so many different neighborhoods and so many different booming environments that there's such rich culture in each section. So it's, it's a really nice place to be. Yeah, definitely. And um, interestingly, I was telling you before, I live in Prague and there's actually a direct flight, Prague to Philadelphia now, which is really interesting. Direct, direct flight every day on American Airlines. Wow. So I'll be there in two weeks, which, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. So Mikey, you've obviously, look, looking at your website, you've done a lot. What's, can you just talk us like starting from the beginning, like what, what your background is? Like, did you start off as a chef? What did you do sure. first and how did you get into running events? I always say that I'm an event planner and a chef um, just because my passion does lie in planning events, whether it's social or corporate functions. But my whole career started, I come from a big Irish Italian family. When I was younger, my parents actually owned a cooking school. And right. so I was, I really grew up in the kitchen, whether it was taking classes or eventually teaching classes, I was able to transform that childhood passion of cooking into a career. And my career really took off when I appeared on Food Network's Chopped. Right. And then I actually won the series. So did you um, ever so, have a job or did you just work in the, work with your family and then just go straight into kind of doing your own thing? Yep, exactly. Yeah, cool. And it was just an awesome experience to be on Chopped and then to see all the opportunities that came from it. And I think that's a true testament to show that if you have a passion for something and you're able to display it in a way that's authentic, then opportunities really do follow. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I was uh, I was listening to an interview with, with Jamie Oliver. I'm sure you know from from the UK, and yep. um, he was he got his start where behind the scenes in the kitchen, and Jamie Oliver uh-huh. turned up, and he just like happened to have this great personality and started talking and chatting to them. So it was like completely by accident how how he got his start. It was a really yes. interesting story. Yes, and that, I love that story because it's true. It's I always tell people if you show up and show the best version of yourself each day, that that opportunities really will come because. That's how life works and that's how networking works. And that's just how, if you ask most successful business owners or most successful people, they'll kind of have the same advice. Yeah, now, so, so what happened after, so you were on this TV show, Chopped. What did that lead on to? Like, what were like the next steps for you? Sure, so that led on to a few other TV appearances on Food Network. And, and in doing so, that's when companies, individual people, and different social and corporate clients really came out to me to start planning their events. 
planning their dinner parties, different functions. And that's when I was able to really transform that passion of mine into a career. So basically you, I, you were on the show and then I guess certain people watching, I, I guess people who could afford like high, high net worth people who could maybe afford your service, they started contacting you and then saying, look, could you come and run a dinner party or a party or some kind of event for me? Absolutely, exactly. And that's how I say in this day and age, social media and technology plays a huge part in any successful business because that's where I got most of my clients. Yeah, so that was my next point. Obviously, I'm looking at you. You've got you've got an Instagram, Facebook, a YouTube channel, lecture. So, so you you, you appeared on this show, and then, and people, I guess, people Googled you, and then landed on one of your social accounts, and that's how they got in touch with you, I guess. Yes, yes, and I think that's why it's funny because I. In the past, it was like through email. Now it's through direct message on Instagram. Uh, and is that is that still is that still the main way people are getting in touch with you via Instagram and Facebook and things? Probably a nice blend. I have a, a large client book now, so it's mostly reoccurring events or referrals. And that's also a tip I have for anyone who's trying to get into the event industry is is the power of referrals because right. if if a client is having an event and their guests are having the time of their lives, they're always more inclined to say, who planned this? Who's behind this event? And I've gotten so many events from previous guests at my clients' events. That's so, fascinating. Yes, the power of referrals is strong. So Mikey, let's start from the beginning, because I mean, I run a lot of events myself, but I don't know, this is a whole different area for me, the whole event planning industry. I don't, I don't know how it works. So could you explain to people, like how, how does this work? Like what's, what's kind of a business model, I guess, in a way? People, you charge a fixed fee to run a party, or, or do you have some kind of call with a client, you, you find out exactly what they want, and then you give them a budget, and then you pay all the caterers and stuff? Like how does it actually work in reality? Sure. Sure. So in terms of business, I do charge um, a flat rate based on whether it's a corporate or social client yep. and then based on a few more things, um, the amount of hours that my that I'll need to put into the event. Um, but I do charge a flat fee. Most event planners will do a flat fee or commission based. At the end of the day, a flat fee is still commission based because it's your it's your kind of gauge of what you think that total cost will be from then. I kind of call myself the ringleader of the circus when it comes to event planning because I'm the one who's curating the vendors, assigning those contracts, ensuring that they're all held in place for the event itself. So it's, it's really the person um, in terms of social or corporate events who is curating those vendors, working directly with the client to say, here's a few offers we have, here's three caterers, let's have a tasting, here's three venues, let's check them out. Um, and, and from there, really coming up with the event of the client's dreams. So I guess the commission way, is that, is that so what people do then is they'll say, okay, the catering costs this, the lighting costs this, et cetera, and then they charge 10% or whatever on top of that. Exactly, exactly. Right. So I guess, and, I guess you're always better because you're not like, I guess those guys could be incentivized just to like get more expensive things because then their commission's higher, you know? I guess exactly, with you, it's like exactly. you're gonna, you charge them a fixed fee and, and, and give them the best experience. Exactly, and that's what I tell my clients for the fixed fee process, it's, it's a win-win for both of us just because I do have extensive contacts in terms of vendors. And so they'll oftentimes cut deals or they're able to give us more for that fixed price so that the client's not paying more for me to make more as well. So I, I always recommend the fixed fee, especially for someone starting in the event world, just because if you're not, it could seem – a client could ask, are you, are you charging us more for these vendors so that you can make more on the back end? Right. Do you know what I mean? So, Mikey, like, let's cast. If you could cast your mind back, like it's always interesting to hear the origin stories. Like, what a what was the first event you ever ran? Obviously, you said you you on a TV show. People started contacting you. Like, what was the first event you actually you know charged people to you charge as a, as a clients to run for them? Sure, I think the first big event that I did was for was probably for a a, a client of mine. Their their child was was celebrating their first birthday. Um, and it was a really elaborate, over-the-top first birthday at a country club, um, about 150 guests. And that was, a, that was a party that I loved, and it was one of my first, because I was able to really take a lot of the creative control. They right. were less they, – they didn't care as much about incorporate these colors and da-da-da-da. We really worked together. Yeah. And that's something that I love in terms of a social client, just because if it's a social client – the boundary is less tight. Um, right. Sometimes for corporate clients, they have a set 
color palette they want to use. They have a set venue. They have a set date. They have a set exclusive caterer. So, so social clients are definitely a little bit more um, able for me to let my creative flag fly. Yep. So that was definitely one of the big first events was that first year old birthday party. And and how did how did you work in the first one? I mean, did do you always meet the client face to face, or do you sometimes just get on the phone or video chat? Like, are you usually meeting yes. people like face to face? So the one thing about me is I'm a people person. I love to meet people, and I work off meeting people and working with their energy. So I always require meeting the client face to face before yep. I even sign a contract with them, just because I. I like to really know that the client I'm working with is someone who I can work with. And that's another tip I have for anyone in the event world or anyone who wants to be in the event world. If there's ever a client who has unrealistic expectations or just doesn't seem like you could be a good fit, saying no is sometimes better than getting yourself into a situation where an event really won't work. Right. And does that happen? Do you sometimes just have to say, look, I can't, I can't do this event? I outright said it to several clients before. I just don't think it's a good fit. I really appreciate your time. Um, I've even referred other event planners to them just because I'm not someone who specializes in that type of event. But here are two others that I've worked with. And I know they're great because I think in, in this industry, your reputation is everything. And yeah. it's it's best to stand behind your events and not not try to put on an event that you don't feel works for you and and what do you ever run kind of large events like corporate like kind of big banquets and conferences or whatever or do you, is it typically kind of I mean, what's the range like what's the range in terms of number of people the, the events you run sure so i would say the range is pretty large just because it depends I've, I've done many dinner parties for 12 guests and i've done corporate functions for about 350 Right. Uh, 350 right. guests. So it does range. The thing about me is I love them both just for so many different reasons. Um, I do a lot of ho <clears throat> I do a lot of holiday events for corporate clients just because I love the holidays and I have I've done them for a few companies years and years and years and years in a row now. So that's another tip I have for any anyone trying to break into the event industry is if you've worked with a client previously is always to reach out again that next year or that next time to say, oh, I know our event's coming back up. I'd love to work together again um, because that's a way to really lock in that that client and turn them into a loyal customer. Definitely, and I, I guess I guess especially if you're talking with individuals, you know, you maybe can even go back twice a year, birthday parties, like children's celebrations, Absolutely. Christmas, things like that. Just to step in here quickly to mention our sponsor, Events Frame, a project I'm co-founder of. And I want to mention our integrations, which we believe are the best available. Firstly, payment integrations. You can connect any payment gateway, such as Stripe, PayPal, or Braintree, or even bank account or take cash. You can connect everything to EventsFrame. We also have the best marketing integrations out there with every email marketing system, including MailChimp, Zapier, Infusionsoft, Aweber, Drip. And we've got deep integrations with all the social media platforms like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. We've got thousands of events live on EventsFrame right now, ranging from small community meetups to huge trade shows and conferences. Check it out over at eventsframe.com. That's E-V-E-N-T-S-F-R-A-M-E.com. And now, back to the interview. Great. And where do you work? I mean, obviously, we, we talked about New York and Philadelphia. Are, are, you, is that, are they kind of the two main places where you're doing stuff? Yes. Yep. And I, and I own and operate, my company's called The Mocha Group. And we do corporate and social functions. And it's funny, it's called the Mocha Group because ever since I was a kid, everyone called me Mocha because of my energy, kind of right. like a coffee right. mocha. And so I, I really transformed that into my brand. Cool, the, the mocha group.com. Now, how, in terms of like people looking to get into this, obviously you mentioned build up a solid social media presence you know build build great connections and obviously you know you stay in touch is there, is there anything any other kind of basics you think if people starting out with doing this like like all that let's say someone's like they've run like they know they can run a good event so they're the guy or the girl who's been running parties they've run really good dinner parties maybe they've organized great birthday parties but they've never done it kind of professionally you know they've never taken yeah. the next step like what would you say something like that whatever basics should they get in place to, to get started Sure. So I know I mentioned earlier, I would definitely say for anyone trying to really transform that personal passion into a profession would be to start, I don't even want to call it a portfolio, but something like a portfolio. And inside just a one sheet about 
you and your mission statement, what you do as an event planner. But then the biggest thing are referrals. So yep. even if those yep. past clients were friends or family or friends of family, um, just to get referrals from them. Because as I always say, I always say, Dan, I say, pictures can lie, menus can lie, but a, a past client won't lie. That's a good point. And so, and so if you have a portfolio with 10 referrals or 10 recommendations saying, this is Dan, this is his phone number, and this was the event that I planned for him. And of course, checking with those clients beforehand as well, saying, would you mind if clients called you? Just yep. because in, in this industry, the power of a good experience speaks volume. So right. I would always say, I would recommend starting a nice portfolio, of course, including those images, according those, including those menu concepts, but then also making sure you have those referrals. Because as I said, photos lie, but referrals really can't. Um, Definitely. And then from there, and then from there, just doing your best to really get your name out there, marketing on social media. But then I'm also marketing. Um, a tip I have for new event planners is reaching out to smaller restaurants who don't have an in-house event planner and saying, "Here's my information. If you ever wanted to collaborate on an event, we can definitely talk." That's a great tip. So, so I guess larger restaurants that they tend to do this themselves. They got somebody on staff yeah. who deals yeah. with this kind of thing. Yeah. So larger restaurants typically will have an in-house team or an in-house person, but a smaller restaurant, maybe a smaller BYO or some, some just smaller concepts don't have it. Right. Um, and so if you can, if you can make that position for yourself on a, on a collaboration basis, whether it's I'll take 5% or whatever is attractive for both parties. Interesting. Like I, I um, on the podcast, I, I, I talked to a guy called Will Will Kunthart from from the UK. He's got a great company called the Lost Estate. He's a former classical music conductor, and he runs these like immersive experiences. They're really amazing. I think he's doing one okay. in New York actually. He's, lo he's looking at it, but they're all based around you know different themes and and you know he, he did one about Dickens' Christmas Carol, which the whole thing was based around that. But um, that's kind of you know that's an interesting difference between that kind of business and yours because. You're both creating an experience, but but they're actually going out and marketing and, and selling tickets, whereas you're just working for the client. You know, you, you don't have to yeah. worry about. It. Do you ever do it that way, where you actually go out and, and make your own event and sell tickets, or do you just always work for the client? I typically work with the client. Um, I've been offered a few immersive experience, whether it's like a pop up experience or a pop up brunch, but yeah. I haven't done any of those yet. That's definitely something. They're I'm super popular now. I mean, it's really you know, the yeah, that no, whole it's thing. Super popular, super trendy. Just because the thing with those, Dan, is is the the exclusivity of it. The fact that it's a one time thing or a limited yeah. engagement. Those kind of events are the ones that the market really want to be a part of because they feel that it's it's really a an exclusive event. And I think yeah. that's as an event planner where you're always looking to create. And with those immersive pop up experiences they create it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So Mikey, just, just to just sort of change a little bit, like you mentioned about dinner parties and things, like what, what kind of tips would you give to someone, forgetting the sort of business side of it for a minute, someone running their own you know, dinner party, like what, what, is there any kind of things you could say just that they may not have thought of just to make it a really cool event? Any, anything kind of interesting you, you know? Sure. So I would say for the at-home event planner, or the person who loves to DIY their own event dinner parties would just to to keep the menu as simple as possible. Not not as simple as just a salad or whatever it may be, but but working on dishes that you know that you can master, not dishes that you think you're going to impress your guests with. I would always say if it's a dish you have not made before, try to make it before the first time is the dinner party, you know. So yep. so have a little bit of practice with it. Um, so that's a huge tip is keeping it simple and that goes for the menu, but that also goes for, um, just the whole event itself. Um, another tip I have Dan for anyone hosting their own dinner party at home would be to hire a bartender. That's that, is great one, tip, yeah. that is one that I always tell friends and family and clients is, is to splurge on a bartender just because nothing's worse than being the host who's running around with a chicken with their head cut off. Because having a bartender there to do half of the work, whether it's just beer and wine, whether it's beer, wine, and cocktails, it's yeah, just... Yeah, well, a bartender can do cocktails. I mean, I know what it's like when, when you try to do cocktails at home, it just takes forever and you just can't do anything. It does. Right? It does. And you know, how the, you know how it works, hosting a dinner party. The minute you're making drinks, then someone needs you in the kitchen or something's burning or someone's calling. It's, it's too chaotic. And I think that's 
that's a section that is really essential is to have to splurge on the bartender because that's that's definitely really a nice memento for the guest as well. It makes them feel like you put a little bit more thought and effort into the event. And it, it does allow them to have some really nice handcrafted cocktails as well. That's cool. Yeah, well, one thing I've, I've a couple friend of mine got me onto, which is, a, we, you know, we've, we've recently got a house outside Prague and we started doing more kind of dinner parties. And, and one thing I, which I got, again, I got from a good friend of mine was he's always like, get a few different groups of people who you can introduce to each other. Because first of all, yeah. it's great for you because you, you're then the guy who's connecting these people and people always are thankful for that. But also it yeah. makes it more interesting if they're not just meeting all the people they, they already know, you know. Absolutely. And Dan, to speak on that, I always tell friends and family, and I do this personally for my dinner parties, I always use place cards for table setting ah. just so that I make sure that I don't see the people who know each other next to each other. I always like to mix it up, as you just said, just because that's how it works in this world is whether it's networking, making new friends, or just hearing new stories and hearing new experiences. If you're at a dinner party sitting next to the same person every single time, it can get stale. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but with the integration of using place cards at the table setting, it really enables the guests to meet new people, to hear new stories, and to really connect on a deeper basis. Yeah, definitely. And do you like, in terms of your own dinner parties, do you have you got like a? Do you kind of do it regularly? Do you say right every month or every two or three months I'm going to do one, or do you just keep I it ad hoc? I don't. I wish I did. I wish I could, but my schedule is just ever changing. Um, when I do host a dinner party, though, it's it's like an extreme sport because <laughs> I feel. I feel like it's for chefs or event planners or really anyone in an industry that is client facing. When your friends come to your dinner party, they're expecting to be wowed. That's the thing, uh, the pressure's on, yeah. Yes, and, and the pressure is definitely on. I've got a friend of mine uh, in Taiwan who's a really successful guy. He's, he's got this thing he does at home called First Fridays, where every, the first Friday of every month he does like a drinks yes. party at his house, you know, and connect. I, it wasn't his idea. I mean, I think people in Silicon Valley do it and stuff. But he, but he gets all these different people along, and, it, and it's like, and it's really, you know, positions himself at the center of his kind of town in Taiwan. It's really yes. interesting. That's awesome. And I love that idea because it's – with that concept, it's something that's done monthly. Yeah. And so you know it's coming up. You know you can prepare for it. And you can also use seasonal aspects to tie into the event because you know you're going to be hosting a party in the first Friday of October or the first yeah, day yeah. of – Yeah, you're going to have a Halloween theme or whatever. Yes. You can really incorporate theme into that, into that concept as well. Cool. Well, Mike, I know we're, we're almost almost up to our time. I'm, I'm curious. I don't know if you can save the names of any of your clients. Have you, I guess you have had some celebrity clients. Can you reveal them, or is that, is that all under your confidentiality? I wish I could, Dan. I do have NDAs for them. Ah, shame. Um, you can tell me offline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After this, we can talk. Sounds good. Look, Mikey, anything else you want to add? And Where should people go to find you? Any, any links? or what? Should just, just check out your website. Sure. So my website is themikeyrobbins.com, T-H-E-M-I-K-E-Y-R-O-B-I-N-S.com. And on there, there's direct links to all my social media, direct links to a bunch of fun things I have coming up. And also you can, you can contact me directly through there for a dinner party idea, for event planning idea. And even if you have questions, I love to answer those. I love to talk about events, about catering, about any, any kind of those questions as well great and, and in terms of social did you say i mean is instagram the main one for you or facebook or youtube like what, what do you really focus on in terms of your social media presence sure so i really do try to to work on all of them as often as possible i would say in 2019 instagram i think is the most essential just because that's the one that creates the most buzz um yeah. i always say it's it's interesting how social media has changed so much because the users and the demographic of each are so different. So, so when I'll look at my key demos or get those reports from different social media outlets, you'll see like, oh, on Instagram, I'm really popular with this age range, but on Facebook, it's a completely different demo. Sure. Um, so I think that's why it's essential to really keep up, to keep up on all of them. Definitely. Mikey, look, it's been a real pleasure to talk. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your time and, and all the best for the future. Yes, thank you so much, Dan. Do you want to sell more tickets to your amazing events? Events Frame Event Ticketing has been built to minimize the amount of time it takes to buy a ticket. Result? You sell more tickets. Check out eventsframe.com 